Welcome everybody. My name is Cheryl and I'm an adult services librarian at the Westland Public Library. Today we are pleased to present local author Gloria Brown. Gloria started working for the U.S. Forest Service in Washington, D.C. in 1974 and worked her way up in the agency by moving west and qualifying as a forester through Oregon State University. As a forest supervisor, Brown received many awards for mediating conflicts between the government and environmentalists. She tells the story of her Forest Service career in her new book, Black Woman in Green, which was published this spring and was written with Dr. Donna L. Sinclair, an adjunct history professor, public historian, and museum professional who specializes in oral history. Now I'll turn it over to Gloria. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, my name is Gloria Brown, as you said, and I was born in Washington, D.C., and I worked for the Forest Service in the Bureau for probably 34 years total. I retired in 19, no, 2007. Interestingly enough, when I came into my last job, it was a fire. And when I went out of my last job, it was a fire. But I'll, I'll talk more about that later. I want to talk about why I wrote this book. And one, there's several reasons, and I'd like to recite each of them. One is, of course, my children. We don't, we, don't, we don't share our histories and stories like we did when our families were slaves and we passed the story on. And I wanted to make sure my kids and their kids and their kids had a memory of what I did and why I did it. Second, it was very important to me to speak from my voice into an agency that is predominantly white male. And it, since I worked with them, I thought it was important that they hear from me what my experience, experience looked like for me. Last, it was important for women, but not just women, but especially women, to know and read about the process, the, 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 the way I got from A to B to C. Not necessarily a process that you would, they would need to use, but certainly understanding how I got from A to B to C, because it, it was not easy. It, it took some sacrifice, but in the end, in my opinion, it was all worth it. So this is, this is written for the many women that might read this book and be inspired to write themselves or uh, whether they publish it or not, just put it on paper. And I said that was last, but the really last one is the employees. The employees who worked for me, or better stated, that I worked for. I could not have had any of this joy in the job that I did. I could not have had any of the awards and accolades, accolades that I received unless, uh, without my employees. And, and I'm just, I want them to know through this book how grateful I am. So about the book, um, again, um, I started with the Forest Service, as Cheryl said, in Washington, DC. I was going to be, uh, actually I was in uh, University of Maryland. I was going to be a, uh, I worked during the day with the school at night. I was going to be a, a journalist. And um, unfortunately, my, my husband died in a car accident, and there I am with three kids, and I had to figure out, okay, what do I do now? Since I was working for the Forest Service, making a somewhat decent salary, not really enough to take care of three kids, but enough more than the average person, single mother probably made, and I could not afford to go into the bottom of the journalism media medium. I decided I would stay with the Forest Service. Uh, with that thought, of course, it came to me. I, 
when, when I just made that decision after I graduated from the University of Maryland, when I made that decision, along with that decision came the goal. And the goal was more money, more money, more money. So I could take care of my kids, so I could send them to college, so I could be independent. So how did I do, how did I do that? Well, quickly, uh, I spent 10 years in the Washington office. I started as a, what they call a dictating machine transcriber. And uh, you, you take these huge books and then you transcribe them and I guess they go somewhere forever. But that was my, my job at the time. Uh, and I, after I got my degree, I realized, well, I can't sit in this office with nobody seeing me, knowing me. I need to move to something that it was in concert with what I did as it, in my journalism degree, what I wanted to do. So to that end, I, I left that job and went to work for what was called information and education. And it was a job where, um, it was a fun job. I was sort of the national voice for the Forest Service. So if they wanted a, a book or information, they started, it was my phone number that they would call. And I was happy to say, good morning. This is the Forest Service, Gloria Brown, how can I help you? So I stayed in that job probably about three years. And as I stayed in that job, I watched the director across the hall from me and the people who were coming and going. And one day, I asked him because he had a really nice Southern social personality versus the other guys. And I asked him, Lamar, how, how, where are your people going? And he says, well, they're promoting out into the field, which I didn't know a lot about. And he says, um, it, it's a career move for them when they come to work for me. He was director of resource planning and assessment which is a national office for assessing the land and the resources. So I said, well, how can someone come to work for you? How can I, I was very specific, how can I come and work for you? Because this is what I want to do. I want to figure out the field. I, wanna, I want to work in the field. What can I do? And he said, well, the next job you, uh, uh, the next job you qualify for, apl apply. Well, I was in an information assistant job when I was in information and education. The first job that became available in, 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 that, was, in that respect was a secretary. So I left that job and I went to be Lamar's secretary. And everybody was wondering, well, why would you leave information assistant to be a secretary? Well, um, so I, the irony is, as soon as I got there, about a week later, Lamar left and was promoted to a deputy chief job in our Washington office. And I became the secretary to Tom Hamilton and, oh, well, Tom was the director. So I would, I would say he, he, had, he had the four. he had the most, I had the most information about him in my book. And what Tom did was we, him and John Dutrell, who was his assistant director, the three of us would sit around the table and talk about what I'd like to do after we did, we would do my performance. And as a result, make a long story short, Tom enabled me to get to work with other people from the field, like rangers would come in, um, uh, staff, from other offices along in the United States would come in and I would, I would work with them and, um, and they would leave and usually be promoted up to some other job. So it, to make a, again, to make a long story short, Tom was totally um, supportive of that. And I ended up not only working with people from outside of the Washington office, but ended up traveling to the Pacific Northwest, which was, uh, which is, I went to Oregon. He sent me to Oregon on a detail. 
oh my gosh, it was the most beautiful place I, <laughs> I had ever seen. I don't know if you know about Washington, D.C. and these buildings and this traffic and you can't hardly see the stars. But the Pacific Northwest, especially Oregon, Mount Hood, it, it, I fell in love. I, I fell in love. And I got um, Jerry um, Mason, who was the public affairs officer on the Willamette. And this is the job I eventually wanted. He took me into what I would call my first walk through a national forest. And it was, I, I don't have the words to really articulate how amazing it was to me, but I think I said something like in the book, something like it was like going into a cathedral. And, and, and your thoughts and your prayers just exhumed from your body. Uh, and then he, sent, he took me to the, the second largest waterfall in Oregon. And, and that, that was another wonder. So back to DC, tell Tom I'm ready to go. I was... Uh, GS9, because he changed my secretarial um, description to um, a public affairs specialist position, a GS9. GS9? Yes, a GS9. Or GS7. Seven or nine. And I told him I was ready to go. So what Tom did was he, we have seven regional forests in the United States. But, you know, he sent that word out. Not, I, I was hoping that the director of information, because he sent it to all the information directors um, in Atlanta, Georgia, that's our region eight, would, you know, say, okay, I'll take her. Because one of his um, criteria was that I was to get a 9-11. So a year after I worked for them, I was to automatically get an 11, GS 11, General Services 11, which is how they ranked employees in the Forest Service or in the United States government, for that matter. And um, that was one of the criteria, if, if they took me. Well, the only one that came through, <laughs> to my surprise, um, was the director of Missoula, Montana. Her name was Beth Horn, and Beth and I had worked together in the Washington office when she had come in for a detail. And now she was the director of information in Missoula, Montana. So that's where I went, me and my three children. I'd never been west to live. Um, the kids hated Montana, they, Missoula. They didn't, they didn't chew, they didn't fish, they didn't ski. Um, they said the, the kids' biggest outlet for fun was riding up and down the strip. And of course, you can't even do that in Washington, D.C. But I asked them to manage and, you know, for mom and for the sake that we're making more money. And we had a beautiful home that we were living in versus we were living in apartments after my husband died. So I stayed in Montana probably almost two years and the worst case scenario happened. And that was, there was discrimination against my oldest daughter. All three of them went to the high school in Missoula. And um, it, was, it was ugly, it was in the newspaper. Um, people ask me, um, well, why didn't you, you know, why didn't you do anything about it? I, and, and I was, I was at a loss because my husband um, was gone, which he's the one I would send to fight battles, but he was gone. So what I did do was I asked to see the principal of the school to try to find out why my daughter was expelled well, not expelled, but why she had to get uh, dismissed. And the woman who, act, the young girl who actually attacked her, who also got dismissed, but she was allowed to 
uh, involve herself in, into intercurricular activities, which their book clearly said that when you're on, when you're not in, when you're not in school, you cannot do that. You can't you can't involve yourself. So I wanted to know. The other two kids came up, came and said that she was, um, you know, practicing basketball. She was the captain of the girls' basketball team. So I went in to ask the principal, why is she doing that? And my daughter still made um, to be suspended at home. And I didn't get to see the principal, but I did get to see the um, assistant principal. And I went in and we shared niceties. And I asked, why is Camille still suspended and this young lady being able to, and I had my book that the school publishes about rules and regulations. And she's allowed to um, participate in extracurricular activities. This is still hard to, to talk about, write about, but what he said was, Mrs. Brown, we did not have these issues until your children came to our school. I couldn't believe what I heard. Everything, if, if he said anything after that, it didn't matter because I was already up in the reading and I didn't even ask him to have a good day. I went home that night and I just cried. What, what do I do now? The principal won't see me. The assistant principal is racist. So one of my friends that I worked with, because I loved working in Missoula, um, I told him what had happened. Well, he told our regional forester, which is the highest level uh, that you can be in a region. There's regions, there's forests, and there's districts. So he was at the highest level of our organization in Missoula, Montana, which was also one of the biggest uh, suppliers, uh, one of the biggest, um, they, 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 what's the word? They hired the most people in Missoula. And the um, corresponding ranger districts in Montana. So he told, um, told uh, Overbay what happened. Then Jim Overbay, my regional forester, called the superintendent of, of schools here in Missoula and told him what had happened and told him, well, you know what? <laughs> I really need you to have the principal call Gloria so that she can have, she can say her piece and she can get the in information that she, as well as the Forest Service, needs to understand why her daughter was still being suspended. So soon after I got to my desk, back to my office, they, um, I did, I got a call from the um, principal asking me what would be a convenient time for me to come in and see him. And I, I said that evening, I can, I can come in you know, right after school. And I did. And again, to make a long story short, I said what happened and then why I was, why I was there. And he said to me, you know, Mrs. Brown, I am so sorry. He said, what he should have explained was the captain of the basketball team was going to be playing in Kalispell or uh, Montana. And that's where she was raised, lived, and where all her family were. So they were all looking for her to come for that game. Her father was abusive and several times the boys came in, they'd been abused or you know, she'd come in with a slap on her face. And so they were afraid that if, if he knew that she started the fight and that if she was not allowed to play, that he would have been very upset. And they were scared, worried about what he would do to her. And my last question to him, 
Did anybody worry about my child? Did they think about the mental health of my child? Did, it, did they think about what it looked like to my child in my family? And he was honest. He said, I'm so sorry. No, we didn't. And I said, okay, do have a good day. I appreciate the truth. And I left. My daughter decided she'd never go back to that school. So I ended up, ended up sending her back east to live with my, my mother and father. And uh, we'd never been separated as a family. So I still cried. Um, but the agency, Forest Service, will take care of its people. When they realized that Nikki was gone, they um, set me up for a, a change of, of duty station. And the duty station, the new duty station was Portland, Oregon. And so um, I went to Portland as an affairs specialist, GS-11, and probably stayed in the regional office maybe two years. Um, and I remember telling John Luttrell, who you might remember, was the assistant director in RPA when I worked in Washington, D.C. I remember telling John that my goal was to get from the regional office to, a, to the forest, on a forest. And John said, well, Gloria, I don't want you moving too fast. You know, you need to get one, do one job done before you start thinking about another. Well, John obviously didn't know me because I could chew gum and walk at the same time. So I could do both. I could do my job very well, as well as continue to plan for my future. So the forest I ended up on was the Willamette. I need to make this really quick. The forest I ended up was on the Willamette. And later in the book, you'll find that Jerry Mason, the public affairs specialist on the Willamette, who had taken me into a forest for the first time when I was on detail, I learned through the grapevine that Jerry was going to be retiring. Well, a plum job for any public affairs officer is on the Willamette National Forest. And so I went down to see the forest and the forest supervisor before they put out the announcement, because I couldn't have gone down if the announcement had been out. And I laid out why I wanted their job and why it was important that they would hire me. And I also explained if, if you hire me and I do what I said I was going to do, I would also like a sabbatical to Oregon State University to get the credits to um, qualify as Forrester. And I won't take any travel, I won't take any training, I will keep my head to the wheel until we got this done, which was publishing the forest plan, that they were very late behind all the other national forests in doing. I don't think they believed me, but they were a little stunned. And, uh, and, but they said, okay, you know, apply, and if you get the job, uh, we will agree to, to your presentation. We'll agree to do what you've asked. Well, I got the job. And me, staff, and his bigger staff were able to get the forest plan published. Well, the Willamette National Forest always had this reputation that they were going to do a billion of bust as far as cutting uh, old growth. And it was the environmental time in our agency where people were really complaining about how we were managing the National Forest. And so after that, um, Mike, Mike Carrot, the forest supervisor, um, we had taken the um, cut, the annual cut on the Willamette from something like 750 board feet down to, I think it was like, it was something like a 525 board feet a year. Well, he could, he, he was old time school. He'd been in the Forest Service all his life, came up through the Forest Service. 
And he couldn't, he couldn't deal with having to supervise a forest that had been lowered to that standard, which I thought it was raised to a better standard, but he, he couldn't stay. So he put in his, reti his retirement papers, but before he left, he kept his word, and him and the personnel officer and I wrote up our proposal to go back to Oregon State University to get my degree. And to this day, Mike and his wife, Sue Carrick, we are, we're still friends. I went, to, I went to the university, went through the classes, got certified, went to Rigdon Ranger District as a deputy. I left Rigdon Ranger District because the Forest Service was going to offer me a GS-12, you know, a GS-12 temporary duty for one year. That's what they offered me after I did my time on Rigdon Ranger District as an assistant district ranger. And um, I, 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 know, I knew that in one year, you, things could go bad. And, and I knew there was so much riding on me that I couldn't risk things going bad and I had no, ch no chance to fix it which if you had more time than one year, you could work on making that right, making that better the first year, the second year. So I, I didn't take their offer. Instead, the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, offered me a job in Eastern Oregon, in Baker City. And I took that job. And it was a wonderful job. I, read the book. <laughs> it was so funny. All my jobs were really great jobs to tell you the truth. And all my jobs, I was, I was, I was the only African-American person at the table. Whether I worked with foresters, whether I worked with miners, whether I worked with, whoever I worked with, I was the only African-American at the table. And many times the only woman. But I, I loved Eastern Oregon in the job. Uh, the, ra the ranchers, um, the Pacific Northwest Ranchers Association gave me um, a plaque when I was leaving Baker City. The Mining Association gave me a plaque when I was leaving the to go to my next job. And the reason both organizations did that was because when, when issues came up with their, um, with their range, with people that were letting their cows eat on the land, most times forest supervisors would let a staff handle it or they would handle it and have the person come into their office. I didn't do that. When I had an issue with one of the ranchers, I went to their, I asked permission to come to them, to their home, to their kitchen table. And we talked about it together. And I explained why I keep, couldn't keep going on and let's try to figure out together how this would work for you and for me. With, and, and they appreciated it. With the miners, there was new rules that were sent out from the Washington office. And a lot of miners, they, they didn't have, um, some of them didn't have high school diplomas. And so they really didn't understand the new regulations. And so what I did was I had the person that was in charge of, of mining, the geologist actually, on my district, go and have classes with them showing them how to finish out, how to fill out their paperwork for according to the new regulations. And they really appreciated that. Uh, from, from Baker City, I went to Washington, D.C. From Washington, D.C., I went to Mount St. Helens. From Mount, Mount St. Helens, I went to the Sayus Law National Forest. And from the Sayus Law National Forest, which is here in Oregon, along the coast, 
I went to the Los Padres National Forest in California, Southern California. And that's where I ended my career. So with that, if you have the book or if you read the book, you will see um, how, how what I said come together from one chapter to the next, which is how I wrote it. And you will also see my admiration for the people I worked for and the brilliant people on the ground, not in Washington, D.C., but on the ground actually doing the work. And to this day, I am very proud of them, and many of them remain my friend. Thank you, Gloria. Gloria's books are available to buy from both Amazon and Powell's, and they're available at the library as well. We'll have those links in the description below. Thank you, Gloria, for telling us your story today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Cheryl, for asking me. Have a good day. You too.